Now, as most of you know, it's been 12 years since my baptism, and for some of you, it's been a little bit longer than that. And I can remember, you know, growing up in the church and coming to the feast days. I remember how excited I was, you know, for this time of year. I would get to make new friends, get to see some old ones sometime if you're visiting an old site. You know, you got to be in the church choir, which was always a lot of fun. You got to eat great food. You got to receive new toys. And you know, all of these different things culminated in making a great feast. And now that I've become older, you know, I still enjoy all of these things. I still enjoy the great food, the great friendships, the fellowship, uh, being in the choir, getting new toys. <laughs> but they don't make the feast great like when I was a little kid. They make it fun, they make it joyful, but there's something else that really makes the feast special for me now. And that is that we get to be with each other. That we get to listen to God's word talked about day after day. That's what makes it so special. You know, if, if we were able to hear God's word preached to us every single day, would that help us stay on track a little bit better? I think so, but that is something that is, you know, personal and up to each one of us. Let's look at Nehemiah 8. And we'll find something very unique in the scriptures that we're going to go over in this sermonette. Nehemiah 8, and we'll begin in verse 13. It says, Now on the second day, the heads of the fathers, houses of all the people, with the priests and the Levites, were gathered to Ezra the scribe in order to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. What are we are keeping now? And that they should announce and proclaim in all the cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches, bring branches of olive oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. And then the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house, or in their courtyards, or the courts of the house of God, in the open square of the water gate, and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booths and sat under booths, for since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so. And there was very great gladness. Also, day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly, according to the prescribed manner. Now the children of Israel, as it said, had come back from ta captivity. And while they were in captivity, they had lost the understanding of keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. And they were so happy that they could once again obey God and keep the feast. Let's look at verses 1 through 12 of uh, Nehemiah 8. And it says, Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra 
You see, the, the people, they wanted this. They were the ones initiating this. Verse 2, So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women, and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and women and those who could understand. And the ear of the people were attentive to the book of the law. So once again, they were engaged. They were interested. Verse 4, so Ezra, the scribe, stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him at their right hand stood a bunch of men whose names I won't try and murder. So skipping to verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people, they stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their face to the ground. <clears throat> and then we see that the men who were standing besides him, in verse 7, they helped the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. Verse 8, and so they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn, do not weep. For all the pe people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink, to send portions, and rejoice greatly because they understand, understood the words that were declared to them. Such a beautiful thing to read. Now these people were sad at first because the law was being read to them. Maybe it convicted them of past sins, things that they had done, and it made them sorrowful even distraught. But Ezra and the men with him, the priests, they told these people, no, that's not what this is about. Don't be sorrowful. Be joyful that you were learning the words of God. Rejoice. Feast. Help your brethren who are, might not have as much as you. Give a little bit to them. So brethren, this time for us is a time of learning. It's a time of great rejoicing. It's a time for us to be deeply drinking from the knowledge that we hear from day to day. You know, we can look forward and rejoice because we know that the kingdom of God is coming. But as was already touched upon, we dread having to leave the feast. Manuela and I were just talking about this morning. She goes, there's only three more days. And it, at times, can be such a letdown, right? Now, during the feast, it's almost like you can set your spiritual shield down for a little bit and become recharged. We can enjoy each other's company and, and share our stories. And it helps to build us up, to strengthen us. But then we leave. And we have to pick up that shield again and remain zealous, realizing that we will be bombarded once again from all sides. You know, it's easy to lose track of what's important when you step back into the world, when you get back to work. You know, our relationship with God it can ebb and it can flow. 
But it's through the weekly Sabbaths that we have the opportunity to stay grounded, to stay focused, to realize that once again, it points to, as Mr. Graham said in the opening prayer, the kingdom. Let's look at Second Chronicles 20. I'm in 2 Kings. That didn't look right. 2 Chronicles 20. And we'll begin in verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness. Oh, nope. Is it 1 Chronicles? Let me look there quickly. Nope. Well, the scripture I'm looking for once again talked about how the people kept the feast days. Now this was the feast days of unleavened bread and Passover. And they kept it for not one week, but they decided to keep it for two weeks. You know, that shows an important characteristic. They willingly, once again, wanted to hear the word of God, not for one week, but for two weeks. They did so, it said in the scripture I'm missing, they did so with great joy. And that's something that's so important, because when we draw close to God, when we do everything in our power to obey him, when we draw close, that's when we find true happiness and joy. <clears throat> but it's a conscious effort. It's one that we choose to make or not to make. Let's also look at 1 Kings 8. We'll read verses 54 to 66. 1 Kings 8:54. And so it was, when Solomon had finished praying all this prayer and supplication to the Lord, that he arose from before the altar of the Lord, from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. Then he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he has promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. So, even King Solomon understood and knew about Moses. Verse 57, May the Lord our God be with us, as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us, nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to himself. Solomon understood that it, it's God who leads us. to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. And may the words of mine, with which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near the Lord our God day and night, that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel, as each day may require, that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God there is no other. Let your heart therefore be loyal to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments, as it is this day. Number 62. Then the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offering, which he offered to the Lord, 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. Can't even imagine that. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. On the same day, the king consecrated the middle court that was in front of the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings, grain offerings, and the fat of peace offerings, because the bronze altar 
that was before the Lord was too small to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings. And at that time, Solomon held a feast, and all of Israel with him, a great assembly, from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt, before the Lord our God, seven days, and seven more, 14 days. And on the eighth day, he sent the people away, and they blessed the king, and they went to their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David and for Israel, his people. The people went home with hearts of gladness and joy for all that had been accomplished here. But as Solomon said, it's God that does these things. It's God that we should let lead us in these things. I love what he said in verse 58, that he may incline our hearts to himself, to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments that he commanded before our fathers. It's nothing new. It's continual. It, it's something that we have to continually look at, work at. Let's look quickly at Philippians 2. Philippians 2 and verse 12. Paul says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to the, all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Brethren, if we have that same focus that Paul has, we will walk out from this feast emboldened, empowered, and ready to put up that good fight until we meet once again next year and also on the weekly Sabbaths. So let's take up arms. Let's concentrate on this way of life with more power and more zeal for it's gonna be worth the effort, I promise you. And I don't have to promise you, the Bible promises you, which is even better.